We're in Exodus this morning. I want you to grab your Bibles, go to chapter 1, just park it there. Let me tell you about Jack. Werner Jack Gano was one, he wanted to be a hero. He desired to be known and recognized as a man who did something incredible. And unfortunately, he didn't have a chance. So what does he do? He concocts a story. He came up with a story about serving as a Marine and being taken as a prisoner of war during the bloody Korean War battle. Gano was from a small Illinois town of Marengo where he served as an alderman there. His story grew until the uniform that he wore on special occasions became laden with medals upon medals. Medals that he ordered out of a catalog. A bronze star, a silver star, two purple hearts, and he would march in parades. He would talk to school children. He would just showcase what he did. He even got himself a special license plate reserved for wounded veterans by forging discharge papers. Here's a man who wanted so desperately to be a hero. However, a Veterans League eventually noticed a lack of records on file for Jack. And they started poking holes through his story. For two years, he denied every accusation and he danced around the issue. But finally, he confessed the deception in an interview. With a local newspaper, he said, enough is enough. Claimed that he could no longer stand the facade. This is what he said to that article writer, his interviewer. He said, you can't imagine what I'm going through. I really didn't know how to shake this demon. But I went to bed every night. It looked at me. It was there in the mirror every morning. I don't want to meet my maker with this on my heart. Jack was bound. Jack was bound for many years in that bondage of being stuck with that desire yet not having it fulfilled and leading him to do something that was not right and he was plagued by that desire. Church, this morning I propose to all of you that in some way, shape, or form, bondage is common. Most of us are bound in some area of our lives, some way, some shape, some form. Most of us spend a good deal of time focusing on and seeking freedom from habits, from sickness, from relationships, and whatever you may want to insert in the blank there. And because bondage is common, the cry and the plea and the desperation for freedom is also a common thing. However, there's an issue, there's a challenge, there's a problem. I believe that there is an issue we face is that although the cry and the plea for freedom is common, the lack of cooperation with it is also common. Cooperating with freedom is an uncommon thing. We cry out freedom, but freedom is often messy. Freedom is almost always accompanied by challenges that we must be willing to chase and embrace and navigate. I want us to be free, but I also want us to understand that we must do some things different. We need to make some changes in order to be free. And somebody say amen to that. So in your Bibles, Exodus chapter 1, we're going to look at a couple of verses. It isn't too deep in the gospel message, in the story of this book, this wonderful plan of God's salvation. It isn't too far into the narrative that there's a heavy weight of bondage that's laid upon God's people. 430 years of slavery is imposed upon God's people and it takes a toll on them. Harsh slave masters come and they become even harsher. Long days in the hot sun, no breaks, no rest, no mercy. And the account demonstrates another time, just one more moment, where the burden has become too difficult to carry. And once strong shoulders who were able to resist, were able to cope, stooped to breaking points. Let's read a couple of verses here, and I just have a few thoughts this morning. I want us to respond and have some time with the Lord today. 
Exodus chapter 1, verse 12, 12 through 14 says this. I'm in the wrong spot. Let me go there. There we go. But the more they were oppressed and the more they multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Flip over to chapter 2. Look at verse 23. During the long period the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. Their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groanings, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This morning, I just want us to look at two things. Propose it to you, and, and you know, as I was thinking this morning, we'll, we'll probably come back to this next time, and, and we'll see how far we can get. But two things I want to bring to your attention this morning is that first, freedom is challenged by this idea. Freedom requires desperation. It requires desperation. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Here's a people who had gone to a place where they needed to be saved. There was a famine that came in the land years and years before. In the time of Joseph, if you've been reading your one-year Bible and you're getting ready for it, you we're getting around that time. Joseph was used by God to deliver God's people in a time of famine. And Jacob and all his sons, they immigrated to Egypt where the only place that had grain during this famine. And that place that was supposed to be a place of blessing. They overstayed their blessing time. There's some things in our lives that are meant for a season. And it's not meant for an indefinite period of time. And if we try to stretch it beyond the season, what was meant to be a blessing can sometimes become a curse. And the people here overstayed their blessing period, and now they were subjected to this slavery. And it tells us that it got harsher and harsher, and it came to a point that verse 23 says, they cried out their cry. This is not a whisper, and I remember your sermon, Pastor Xavier. You don't whisper in times of emergencies. You shout, you cry, you you get loud, you get excited. And they cried out to God. The Bible tells us God heard their groanings. For 130 years of bondage led these people to a desperate cry for help. Freedom requires desperation. This morning, if I look around... You know, our nation, there's a lot of people demanding freedom. A lot of people are crying out and they're frustrated at injustice and frustrated at things that are not going the way that they've intended or desired. There are people who are revolting and and folks who are amassing violence. And there's things that people are in desperate need to be broken free from. We want uh, a release from this COVID situation. We want release from, you know, political oppression. We want release from inequality. We want the release from so many different things. A cry of desperation needs to be lifted up. We see it in the scriptures all throughout when David came and he was bringing food to his brothers. He was checking in on daddy's orders. He came to his brothers who were fighting in the army. And when he gets to that scene, what does he hear? He sees and he hears a man defying God. A giant screaming out blasphemies and taunting the armies of the living God. And David meets that with a cry of desperation. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who should defy the armies of the living God? We see a cry of desperation when Elijah shows up on the scene and he draws a a line in the sand. And he says, you backslidden, lukewarm believers. How long will you waver between two decisions? 
He says there has to be a desperation and a clear-cut cry for God's work to come forth. We see it in so many others, in Hannah, in all these different people of old, in Sarah. We see it in all of the folks of Scripture, Rahab and Ruth and Naomi. We see them cry out to God in desperation in the midst of their situation, desiring a change. If we want to experience more of God, we need to get desperate for him. People who refuse to back down and accept what it's always been like and it's always going to stay this way, we need to get excited and desperate for something to change. Amen? And if we're going to experience more of him, my question is, where is our desperation? Have we become too comfortable with just being good enough? I've heard it said that good is the enemy to great. If it's just good enough, we don't get to experience the greatness. If we're content with just good enough, we don't get to experience the blessing that is there beyond what is already experienced. Have we become too comfortable with survival? Have we become too comfortable with less than, with almost free, with almost well, with almost whole and almost complete and almost saved and almost on fire for God? Are we okay with just almost? Where are those who will cry out for God and say, Lord Jesus? I was so excited about this worship set this morning. This time that we got to just be stripped down and say, Lord God, we need you more. And every time we come together to worship God, we're not coming together to sing some songs. We're coming to meet the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're coming to a place to freely worship without persecution and fear. And we're coming to a place where we can say, besides everything happening in my life, I know I've come to an appointment with the one who holds the whole world in his hands. And I get to worship you and praise you. And God, I need more of you. I'm not content with just enough. Lord, I'm not content with just a little, with just, Lord God, being somewhat whole and healthy. I'm, Lord God, wanting more of you. It's an opportunity that we have to cry out to God, where are the people who will say, Lord, I will go? I will go because, Lord, if I stay, I may die, but if I go, I may be at risk, but if I stay here, I will for sure die. When Moses and the people of God were leaving this land in a few more chapters, they were following a cloud. They were following God's promise, and they said, Lord God, if you don't go, we're not going. God, if you're staying, we'll stay right there. Church, bottom line is, where are those who will sit on the side of the road and cry out, God, have mercy, like blind Bartimaeus? Lord, have mercy and do something in my life, no matter what voices are coming our way and saying, be quiet and stop, you're improper, it's not the right time, this is not your season, this is not your moment, you know, you don't have it all together, you don't know what you're doing, what you're saying, are we desperate to say, Lord God, nevertheless, have mercy on me? Are we pressing in like the woman who said, I had this issue for way too many years and I'm just going to touch the hem of his garment, I'm coming forth and I don't care who's here, I don't care who's pushing, I don't care who's impeding my way, but I need need more of God. I don't know what your circumstance is this morning, church. I know what our circumstance as a church body is, and we need more of God's presence in this place. We need more of God in this community. I look around and I see people who are saying goodbye to their spouses, and they're saying, it's enough. This pandemic, I've had too much of you. I've been in close quarters with you, and all the tension, all the strain, all the things that have been broken, you know what? Enough is enough, and I'm done. I am not for this. I see the challenges where there is no more finances available for families and they're not knowing what to do and the job has been, has been put on furlough. The job has been put on hold and, and the opportunities are gone and they don't know where the next meal is coming from. I, I know that there's a God that needs to come through in these circumstances. I see families who are saying goodbye to loved ones because people are broken and sick and living with chronic disease and terminal illnesses. I know that there's a God that can heal and restore and bring wholeness and healing. And I know that we need to be a people that are crying out to God and saying, Lord, have more with us. Do more in us, God. Establish your ways and still us with faith. Lord God, pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Let us not be content with this measure. Let us not, Lord God, live with this pain and live with this hurt. But God, let us move forward in faith, believing that you can do, Lord Jesus, what you've declared in this book. God, I need more of you. 
If the apostle Paul came forth and his handkerchief was healing the sick and, and casting out demons, God, that meant that this was a man that was saturated in your presence. Lord, I need more of you. I need, Lord Jesus, to believe in you this much. That when people come up to me and they say, you have something that is different. You have something that you can offer. You have something that I need. And so please share with me what you've got. We need to be desperate, church. And when I say we, I'm talking about me. I'm speaking to me first and foremost. I'm not comfortable with where I'm at. I'm not satisfied with what I've experienced. I know that there's a God that has more for me. Because he said that I will do greater things than even he has done. Because he's sending us the promised Holy Spirit. The challenging part of freedom is that we will most likely be set free to the degree at which we are desperate. We want freedom, but here's the challenge. Do you also want desperation? You can want freedom all you want. You can claim it. You can talk about it. You can, you can read about it. You can do whatever. But until you get desperate for it, you don't want it enough. We need God's help. See, I don't want to become besties with brokenness. I don't want to be a soulmate with sickness. I do not want to be pals okay, with paralysis and, and staying stuck in my circumstance. I do not want to be satisfied in my sadness. I want to be committed to freedom, and I want to live what God has declared that I can have. He says, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Is there any desperation evident in my life? Is there any desperation evident in your life this morning? I'm leaving it with you, and I want you to wrestle with that this morning. Number two, I want us to just look at this last idea, and we'll pick this up later next week. Do we confuse our disappointment with desperation? Here's the challenge when it comes to asking, crying, God, Lord, have mercy. This people who cried out 430 years, things were getting harder and harder and more and more complicated. And the pain was more and more. And, and the tasks were being poured out on them. And the tools were being taken away from them. They had to do it all by hand, made it harder. And these guys, were they just disappointed in their circumstance? Or were they desperate? Some of us feel like we are desperate, but the reality is we're just disappointed. We've given up to the situation and circumstance. We're just frustrated at how the things are not working out in our favor, and we're just disappointed. We are just despondent. We are just frustrated at the situation, but our faith is not engaged. It's one thing for us to be frustrated. It's another thing for us to be filled with faith. It's one thing for us to be frustrated and, and disappointed in our situation, but it's another thing to say, I don't like where I am, yet I hold on to faith. Why? Because that is going to cause a whole different set of actions to take place. If we just get frustrated, we get bitter. We start gossiping. We start talking about the issue. We start complaining. We start criticizing. We start talking about how everybody is doing it wrong and how this is not working and that's not working. And nobody wants to be around us in that moment. Nobody wants to be around us as, that, as we're living in that circumstance. Why? Because we become negative and we're the victim. Are we just discouraged or are we desperate? We know this is a challenge because those who have made this mistake have confused disappointment and desperation and they won't do anything for it they will take no action they will make no changes they will adjust no thing and so my question is are we desperate do we want to be free we'll say to somebody i see your circumstance i see you're complaining i see how you're frustrated at this moment in this situation in your life you know what come and worship with me oh no i don't want to do that Oh, I see, that you're, I see that you're frustrated. You want to be free, right? Well, you know what? Change your spending habits. Oh, no, I need that in my life. Oh, you want to be free from that situation? Yeah, you know what? Let's find a small group. Come and, and be around other people who believe in God's word and who are encouraging you and leading you and, and walking in that same direction. Oh, no, I don't have time for that. I want to be free. You know what? All right, so let's get up. Oh, no, I'm just going to sit here like I've sat here for the last seven years and expect a different result. I'm just going to sit here. That's frustration. 
That's disappointment. That's being despondent. That's being despairing. That's being stuck in a situation. But listen, the children of God, they were desperate. Why? Because it says this. They knew that they had something more in store. See, the people of God in Exodus chapter 1, they didn't cry out to God because they didn't have a place to stay. They didn't cry out to God because they were being kicked out of the land. They didn't cry out of, you know, to God because their situation was changing before them and making it more and more complicated for them and they had no other recourse. No, they changed and they cried out to God. They became desperate for him because they realized, hey, wait, God gave us a promise. Pharaoh has made a place for us to live here in Goshen and we can stay here and we've multiplied, we've grown tremendously. We are not being evicted. But you know what? I remember God gave us a promise about a promised land where it would be flowing with milk and honey, where we would have our own fig tree in our yard, where we would be able to see our children go and, and, and worship and pray and, and, and be in their own place. They remembered there was a promise. They became desperate because of a promise. It's time to move, church, to desperation. And I want you to stop and think about all of the promises that God has given to you. If you don't have one specifically where somebody has prayed, giving you a prophetic word, I want you to open up this book because it's a book of promise. And in this book, there are promises. My, one of my first Bibles I had was a green Bible with a leaf on the cover. And I drew all over that Bible, but it was called a promise Bible. And it had highlighted in blue every single promise in scripture. And you would just be blown away at how many promises are locked up in this book. I need to find that Bible somewhere. It might be at my mom's house. It's God's promises to us. I want you to stop and realize God has a promise for you. And he's declared some things over your life and over your circumstance. He has something that you're supposed to experience. And instead of you being bound up in your circumstance, let your circumstance propel you to remember the promise that God has for you. Let your circumstance say, I don't want to live here because I'm not experiencing what he's promised me. He promised me I'm the head and not the tail. He's promised me that he will give it to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He's promised me that I have an inheritance. He's promised me that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He's promised me that I am called by God to do good works that he's prepared ahead of time for me to do. I am called to have my whole household serve the Lord. I have a promise that he is going to heal all my diseases and all my sicknesses. I have a promise that he has laid for me a place. He's preparing a place for me where I will abide with him all the days of my life there is a promise for me and I don't want to be stuck where I am 2021 has to be a different year we can stay where we are in our current situation in our current state in our current anointing in our current ministry in our current jobs and positions we can stay where we are in the current measure of our faith in the current uh, situation in our marriage in our family or we could remember that God has a promise. And I want his promise. It has to overtake our disappointment. It has to displace our discouragement. It has to go beyond the heaviness. And it has to be exchanged for a garment of praise like he's promised in Isaiah. He's got a spirit of praise, a garment of praise for each and every one of us. And so we need to be desperate. And I'll close it with this. Desperation is born out of hope. They could only become desperate and cry out to God because of the fact that they had a hope that their circumstance could change. Some of us, we trust in chariots. Some of us trust in horses, as the Bible says. But I shall trust in the Lord. See, there's, there's, there's scientists coming out with vaccines and praise God for modern technology, but I'm trusting in God who is the one who can heal all my diseases first and foremost. There is stimulus checks that are coming through and, and showing up in people's bank accounts, but I trust in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who will provide for me my every need at every circumstance. You know what? There are people who will fight and vindicate for you, but I'm trusting my paraclete the helper that he's promised, his Holy Spirit, that will lead me into all truth and help me in times of need. When we move into desperation, 
I love the fact that God has moved into action. If we were to say that God responds to need, you could look at every needy country that's out there, every needy community, every needy person and family, and you would see miracles upon miracles upon miracles being done and and affected. But God doesn't move upon need. God moves upon faith. He moves upon action. He moves upon those who say, Lord, I will believe your promises. I will have hope in your promises, and I will align myself to that hope and promise. That's where God moves. And that starts off with the cry of desperation. If I look at that word cry, it's the word prayer. So I want you to stand with me this morning. And I want you, as we're going to close out our time together, I'm going to call you to pray. All right, I want you to pray, and I want you to pray like this is the day that God said, I scheduled an appointment with you. I've put it on my divine agenda. I put it in my calendar, and right now you've been admitted into my place where I abide and where I'm at. And I have come to meet you right now to hear your cry. The Bible says that as they cried, God looked on them, and he heard them. He was moved to prepare and change their situation. So this is how we're going to respond. Whatever your situation is, whatever your issue is, I want you to just say right now, God, enough is enough. There's nobody kicking me out of this reality right now. My boss will allow me to stay the same way. My my, my family, my spouse, my children, they're not expecting or, or asking anything new or different of me. There is nothing within myself that's causing me to change. There's no dire need in which I have to change. But God, I'm choosing to believe in the promise that you've made, that there is more for me. And so today, Lord God, I want to become desperate. I want you to birth inside of me some desperation. I want us to lift up a cry today. And there will be no formal dismissal. If you want to come and you want to stay here till 5 o'clock tonight, you are welcome to do so. If you need me to stay with you, I'll stay with you. I don't care. But I want God to birth something inside of us this morning. And I want us to stop and just watch. I want us to come in and participate and say, God, whatever my situation is, you need to come in and do something. There needs to be a change in our church. There needs to be a change in my life. There needs to be a change, Lord God, in my community. There needs to be a change in my family, in my marriage, in my children. There needs to be a change, Lord God, in this political realm. There needs to be a change, Lord God, with social reconciliation. God, I need you to do something within this place and this season. So I want you to come forth and I want you to pray. Let's lift up those those worship songs one more time. And I'm just going to pray a prayer blessing over you right now. Raise your hands. Father, Father, we ask you come. Come into every home, every life, every situation. Father, your early church, they were known as people who turned the world upside down. Father, the... We're not turning the world upside down if we're hurting more than the world is hurting. We're not turning the world upside down, Lord God, if we are not believing, Lord Jesus, like they believed. And we are bringing forth change and impacting the world, Lord God, with freedom that you have declared. Father, we ask you, Lord, that in every circumstance and situation... That you would break, Lord God, the spirit of fear. That you would break, Lord God, the spirit of apathy. That you would break, Lord God, the spirit of complacency. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would break the spirit of ignorance. Break, Lord God, the spirit of fear and frustration. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would come forth and reveal your will in every circumstance, in every life. And as we sing, God, that we need you more. Let that become, Lord Jesus, a reality within our hearts. Let it, Lord God, burst out in front of, Lord God, every single priority. Let it, Lord Jesus, take the pride of place and prominence in every one of our desires and yearnings. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, speak to your people right now. Individually. We invite you and we welcome you.